All right. Welcome, my friends, to the next episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A. We're taking a fundamental approach to fitness to give you more power, control, and freedom over your healthy lifestyle. And as always, my name is Matt Shifferly, and today's episode is brought to you by many of the resources we're talking about today. They're linked largely down below, including the Red Delta Project Library, all of my favorite exercise equipment, because we are talking about low to no cost options for staying in shape. These days, of course, a lot of us are feeling the pinch. We've got super high gas prices. We've got inflation coming out of our ears. It seems like everything is getting more expensive. And I want to help you turn the tide and help you realize that not only are some of the best resources for diet and exercise very, very affordable, but a lot of the times when it comes to what you can use that you already have may already be the best. So let's just jump right into it. I always love to tell this story about uh, one time I was riding the car with my sister this back in Vermont when uh, it was New Year's and uh, all the New Year's resolution videos or commercials were out on the radio and everybody was hawking their weight loss programs and stuff. And there was this service in Vermont at the time and their tagline was lose 10 pounds for only $10. And which point my sister kind of looks at me and she's like, wait a minute, you, you have to pay money to lose weight? And I had to laugh at that because it really kind of brought the issue to the head of like, of course not. When it comes to actually getting in shape, there's a lot of things that we need to make happen, but very rarely is spending a good amount of money any of it because your fat cells, your muscle cells, your nervous system, hell, almost anything related to fitness doesn't have any direct correlation with how much you are maxing out your credit cards. So this idea that we have to spend a lot of money is something we've got to first break away from because a lot of these resources that I'm going to be talking to you about is very easy to dismiss because it's it's kind of a human nature thing where whenever we feel like we've invested more, we tend to value it more. One of my uh, longtime mentors, Zach Evanish, hit the nail right on the head. And he's like, look, nobody respects free. You could give away the best program in the world for free and hardly anybody will be interested in it. But as soon as you charge $500 for it, you'll have people lined up. And I've seen this time and time again. I've known personal trainers that I worked for in the gym where we could set our own rates. And they always tell me, it's like the best thing I ever did for my business was jack the hell out of my prices. Phone was ringing off the hook if I was the most expensive guy there. Didn't have to be the best. Didn't have to even be the newest or uh, like the most experienced guy. All I had to do was be the most expensive and people saw me as being more legitimate. And I've certainly experienced this myself. I've got a ton of free stuff on my website. I've got loads of free eBooks. I know a lot of times back in the day because I got my start in uh, the early 2000s for Red Delta Project, everybody was like, you gotta have a free eBook, right? To entice people, sell, give away a free eBook. That I've got like nine eBooks on my website, completely free. And ironically, the one that is the hardest for me to give away is the one I call the fitness shortcuts. That yes, you can be in shape and you spend less time and less money and less effort and less. Nobody wants it. So that's why a lot of times when other coaches are saying things like, oh, everybody wants a shortcut. Everybody wants something for nothing and stuff. Not where I'm sitting because you tell people this is free. This is something that is going to be relatively low cost. Nobody's interested in that stuff because we inherently have this thing in the back of our mind of if it's not going to be very costly, then it can't be very effective or worthwhile. But counter to that, there's also the curse of minimalism that's out there of spend as little as necessary or use as the super uh, efficient methods that are out there. And I used to uh, claim that I was a self-proclaimed minimalist as well until I saw the flaws in that reasoning and I totally gave it up. But there's kind of this tug of war that's going on where on one side, nobody respects free or low cost. On the other side, people are like, how do I get it cheaper? How do I get it cheaper? I don't care if it's better. And I'm going to explain why trying to go the minimalist route can actually be by far the biggest waste of all of your money and energy in the long run, as I have learned the hard way. But let's jump right to the chase. Let me share some of these resources. A lot of these, again, down below. Let's get to the simple ones out of the way that I'm sure you see coming a mile away, which are, uh, of course, a lot of the stuff that I offer for free here at Red Delta Project. I've got the YouTube channel. Duh, you're watching this 
on the YouTube channel. If you're watching the live feed, you've got the podcast. Duh, you may be listening to that. And I always tell people, I never hold anything back from any of my fitness resources. I give everything away for free. Every lesson, every tip, every exercise, everything that you see in my books and everything that I offer as a service, as a coach, I always give all of it away for free. The challenge though, is you got to hunt for it. <laughs> everything in my books is already on my YouTube channel. But if you want to sift through hundreds and hundreds of hours of all that and put it all together, be my guest. Or you can just simply read Grind Style Calisthenics and get it all in an, in an hour sitting. You know, same with my suspension calisthenics book that I just barely came out with. All of those exercises are on my website or on the, the YouTube channel. There's nothing in there unusual, new, or that I haven't talked about a million times before. But if you want to put it all together on your own, it's going to cost you a lot of time. So that's one of the things we need to understand is when we're talking about fitness and getting in shape, understand that nothing is actually going to be totally for free. You either spend money and have to invest your time, or you can save a lot of time and invest money and so on. But somewhere along the lines, you're going to have to pay for it. It's just a question of how do you want to pay for it, which of course is totally up to you and whatever is easiest for you. It's like uh, I've got a lot of videos out there on DIY suspension equipment. And it never fails. I've got videos on that. I've got videos on reviews of commercial suspension equipment. And whenever I put up something on DIY stuff, I get people saying, why would I build this when I can just buy one? You dumbass. And then I'll put up one uh, review from like NOSC and they'll be like, why would I buy this when I can just build one? It's like, yeah, exactly. Have options. You've got lots of ways of doing everything in fitness, but it's all a question of which resource are you willing to spend? So don't be too enticed with, hey, this only cost me 15 bucks to build on my own. It's like, yeah, but it may take you all afternoon going to the hardware store and looking for parts and pieces. Sometimes the most expensive things I've ever done is tried to save money. But at the other on, end of the spectrum, sometimes the best, cheapest thing you can do is to spend money. Like I used to train a guy who uh, was very, very successful in the gym and he was a coach. He hired me as a coach. And one day I asked him, I was like, why did you hire me? Like, you know, all these exercises, you know exactly what we're going to do. And he's like, Matt, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't give a rat's flying ass about knowing what to do in the gym. I don't want to have to figure anything out. I don't want to have to think about what exercises to do or how to modify things. I don't want to do any of that. All I want, I want to show up, have you tell me everything I need to know. And then I leave and I don't have to think about anything else. I'm like, great, good. Cause this is someone who understands asset allocation. He's spending the money. So he doesn't have to spend anything else as much as necessary. So it's always about making those choices and something to keep in mind moving forward. We don't want to get stuck in the mindset of I've always got to save money or always got to save time because sometimes that can be much more costly in the long run. Anyway, I got off track again. My apologies. I'm just kind of, I just woke up from a nap like 10 minutes ago. So I'm kind of like, okay, where am I? What am I doing? <laughs> what am I talking about? Who are these people? All right. Frederico coming on in. It's uh, <laughs> good to see everybody. San Diego, see if I can answer some questions. San Diego uh, is asking, I have stubborn forearms compared to the rest of my body, even though I use grip, wrist curl exercises. Well, what else can I do? Or is it just genetics? Yeah, largely genetics. Um, never forget that a lot of aesthetic qualities about the body is down to a lot of genetic uh, com components to it. And also uh, forearms are like calves in much regards where we're talking about a muscle group that usually receives a lot of work in and of itself. So in my experience, we typically need to work it a hell of a lot harder than we're used to. Now for me, uh, for example, my forearms didn't grow until I became into rock climbing. And I joined some friends and we did some indoor rock climbing uh, for an entire winter. And I mean, we basically did forearm and grip strength for five hours a week, and that got my forearms to grow. So I, I hesitate whenever I pull the genetics card, people are like, oh, it's, I can't help it. Oh, it's pointless. No, it may just take a hell of a lot more work than you think. So what I would do if I were you, San Diego, is make every single pulling exercise a grip exercise. Use thick grips, fat grips, towels, and stuff on everything pulling. Don't have, this is my grip exercise, do your work your grip harder with everything. And that's kind of one of the constant themes I have in my muscular, neuromuscular university videos that I come out with, where we take a look at one muscle and it's like, what is it structured like and how can we best work it? 
one of the common themes with all that is if you really want to make this thing grow, work it all the time. Don't think I'm using my triceps on cable press downs. Think I use my triceps on freaking everything. And that way it's getting a lot more of a stimulus to grow for curls, rows, pull-ups, farmer carries. Use those grip tools if you can with everything. See if that's going to get those forearms to start bulging out a little bit. So back to efficiencies of cost. So we've got the podcast here. That's not going to cost you a cent, but it is going to cost you time. we got the YouTube channel. Again, not going to cost you a cent, but it is going to cost you time. But if you want to short change and get all my best information, my books that I have down below, that takes all of the best information I've got on my podcast and my uh, YouTube channel and condenses it into an easier to consume format. And the Kindle versions of, or the PDF versions as well over on Spring, it's 10 bucks. So you can basically like, oh, I got all this for free. How long did it take you to go through all those podcasts? Oh, six months. It's like, so you got paid like three cents an hour <laughs> to do that. You, it's kind of like when um, a friend of mine I used to live with, we used to grow our own vegetables. And I was like, so let me get this straight. <laughs> we just spent $80 in gardening supplies and spent months during the summer to save 45 cents on tomatoes. I'm like, eh, I don't think that was really worth it. Of course, we, we enjoy the gardening. We, we enjoyed having the plants and everything like that. But it's like, yeah, this did not pan out. <laughs> exactly. Case of penny wise, pound foolish as well. So those are my best free resources. Also, if you go over to reddeltaproject.com, I literally have a tab in the header, free eBooks. Okay, I got my Triad Muscle Revolution. I've got my calorie hacking uh, book there. I've got my fitness shortcuts. I've got um, my uh, CC Plus program, uh, the anendum to convict conditioning. So I've got tons of free stuff there. Those are free eBooks. Again, that's a lot of condensed information that's right there completely free. I don't even want your email address. I know a lot of e uh, websites are like, give us your email address and you can get our free ebook. No, you literally click it and you download it. It's that simple to get every single one of those eBooks. So those are some of my best free resources that I offer. Uh, the other free resource that's really good is the Grind Style Calisthenics Workout Program. And this is something that put, took me literally a year to build. It is an entire year of muscle and strength building calisthenics workout programming. It's not a 60 day challenge or a 90 day thing or uh, an app that I had. I tried to make it an app. I've been very disillusioned with fitness apps these days. It's like, no, I don't want an app. I want something much more free and much more flexible and a hell of a lot easier to use. Uh, in my case, I've not had the best experience with fitness apps. Most of them are, uh, well, quite frankly, I think they're terrible uh, in their, their approach because I don't know what you, what you need. It needs to be a much more flexible approach, but I know there's good ones out there. I've got friends who use apps and stuff and they're like, this is great. I like this one. Like, great. Okay. So I'm not saying they're, they're bad, but a lot of these companies now that are out there are like, we'll turn your ebook into a, into an app. It's like, eh, did not settle very well. Cause I kept asking them like, can we do this? Can we do that? Can we make it so that people can change things around? And they're like, no, we can't do that. I'm like, well, if I can't change these things around, then what's the point in even having it? I'll just write out a quick PDF and they just follow along with that. And that's exactly what I did every month on the first of each month. I put out the video and the free PDFs that you can download. One is the workout Bible that explains what the workout's about for the month, a workout log so you can track things. And of course, I've got the master list of all of the videos. I think we're over 100 now in the entire Grind Style Calisthenics program, all 100% free, 100%, no cost whatsoever. If you go into the log too, and it says something like Archer push-ups, that link will take you to the explainer video, which will explain what the exercise is and stuff like that in case you don't know it. So that's probably my best free resource that you can use. If you're like, I just want a good workout program. I want a program for beginners. Grind style calisthenics workout program. It's literally even a playlist on the YouTube channel. If you go onto my channel, you go to the grind style calisthenics workout program playlist. So you don't even have to hunt for the videos. It's all laid out boom, right there. Bookmark that page. And then you have access to all of the videos and all of the PDFs that I've ever come out with on that. And it's all free. And it'll guide you step by step every step of the way. Plus, it's got that flexible structure I always talk about. So you can change it any way that you see fit in order to accommodate your circumstances. But it also gives you some structured uh, programming for an entire year. And it's actually more than that. This is a tip that I got from a, a coach of mine. I, 
I used to work for a gentleman who programmed out all of the workouts they did at that gym for an entire year. And I was like, well, what do you do at the end of the year? He's like, we start uh, right back at the beginning. And I was like, well, aren't you back at the beginning? He's like, no, by the time you get to a year, like, do you really think you're going to remember <laughs> the, the initial program? And even if you did, it's not like you're like, oh, this thing again, it's been a whole year since I've done it. I'm so sick of this. Of course not. And you can just cycle that sucker endlessly. And so the program is just endlessly going every month. It gives you a new workout, an approach to body weight training to keep things nice and fresh every four weeks or so. And uh, it's, uh, like I said, free. There's, there's nothing behind it. I don't want your email address. There, there's no like, I'm going to email you a, a million times and stuff. The way I make money off the back end is, of course, the um, affiliate resources at the end for the products that I recommend. And of course, now I also have the uh, home training uh, that uh, is available as well that I announced last month where you can uh, have one-on-one -on -one coaching from me. So it's one of those things where I give away the product, but technical support is what I charge for. It's, I think, um, what is it? There's a company out there. I think it's Evernote or something that does it that way. They give away the pro product and then they charge for technical support. And that's basically what I'm doing there. So the whole program, free, an entire year's worth of workouts all on me. And uh, boy, I, I tell you, it took a ton of work. I think I logged over like two to 300 hours to make that program and all the videos and everything. So have at it. Enjoy it. Let me get to some more questions. Uh, and also, please, folks, share some of your best resources down below as well, because uh, we're all a community. We're all here to help each other out. What are some of your favorite resources that are low to no cost that we can all benefit from? Frederico is asking here, Matt, I just started a very active standing job. Very nice. I feel that my energy levels are low, maybe starting to raise slowly. How can I get a higher level of energy again? Yeah, it's going to come a, a little bit of an adaptation there, Frederico. I've had a lot of very active jobs myself in the past, and uh, a lot of it did seriously compromise energy levels too. I'd like get off of work. Uh, one of my first jobs ever was washing cars uh, by hand uh, for nine hours a day in the hot sun. And uh, at the end of the day, I'd be like, I have nothing to go off of. <laughs> and I'd be like, I'm going to go to Taekwondo. And I'd just be like sticking my arm out. I'm like, I got nothing left in me. So a couple of things is one is you will acclimate and adapt to the new job for sure. Two is make sure you're eating plenty. Uh, one thing I wish I had known back in the day is that uh, even though it's not a workout, people greatly underestimate their total calorie expenditure when they have more physical uh, employment like that. We typically think of, it's, it's a weird thing. Like I did this where I would like wash cars by hand in the hot sun all day and I would try to eat as little as possible because in my mindset back then, it was like a diet is all about not getting fat and not gaining weight. So I was like, don't eat too much. Don't eat too much. And I'd pack like maybe 500 calories. But for some reason, before I went to Taekwondo, I got to eat like a pig because I'm going to work out, even though the Taekwondo class was hardly physically demanding on some days. But nine hours in the hot sun watching cars was not uh, applicable at all. So typically when it comes to physical jobs, we burn a hell of a lot more than we think we do. So make sure you're eating more. I would increase the portion sizes of some of your regular meals. Make sure you're also getting really good sleep. And uh, I'm, one of the big mistakes a lot of people make is they're like, oh, I'm being very physically active. I'm going to uh, discontinue my workouts, which is a huge mistake because weakness is very fatiguing. <laughs> so still exercise for sure. And I'm sure I don't have to convince you of that. But make sure that you are particularly working your legs and your extension, aka your posterior chain. That's where a lot of fatigue builds up, like in the hips, the back, and in the legs. Because if that's weak, you're going to be tired just sitting around. So make sure you're still working that stuff. And you don't need to crush yourself in your workouts. You don't need to drive yourself into the ground. If you don't have much energy, great. couple of good sets, and you're done. It takes a lot less than you think to create an effective stimulus as I talk about my book, Micro Workouts. But don't feel like you've got to exhaust yourself because if you're exhausting yourself in your job and then you're exhausting yourself in your workouts, it's just stress piled on top of stress and that's really hard to recover from. All right, so we got some of my free resources. How about some of my low cost ones that I like? Of course, uh, NOSC suspension equipment is one of my all time favorites that I always recommend. Again, the link is down below. And the reason why I like them is because they make it the best suspension equipment bar none. 
There's a reason why I pretty much use them and only them. And basically everything else I've used since then has been measured against them and always fallen short. And not only because I think they make the best equipment out there, but it's also extremely affordable. I think their most expensive rig is just under 50 bucks still. Their twin trainer, which is their uber creme de la creme uh, product that they build. And I think it's like $47 on the website. I, I have to check it again, but everything is cheaper than that. Some of their other trainers are like 30, 35 bucks. The home trainer, I highly recommend. That's one of their most versatile pieces of equipment, super lightweight, super portable, and it's not even gonna cost you 40 bucks. So that's something that I recommend is NOS suspension equipment. And if you, you can't get that, or you don't wanna invest in that, some of my DIY suspension equipment, I cover DIY suspension equipment in my book, Smart Bodyweight Training, uh, Grind Style Calisthenics, and of course, my latest suspension calisthenics books as well. In fact, the latest one of suspension calisthenics has my suspension setup, which is probably by far the most uh, cost efficient one. I think I priced it out. You could probably get it away for less than 10 bucks, depending on what materials you have on hand. And it's literally just three pieces. It's one length of rope and two PVC handles. That's it. And that's all it's going to take for you. So NOSC suspension equipment, world fit isometric equipment is a very good option as well. Uh, and that's linked down below. Uh, other pieces of equipment that I highly recommend, simple kettlebell or sandbag. So when it comes to weighted stuff, people are like, oh, weights. I mean, weights can get really expensive real fast. I know in the free weight community, we used to always say, oh, it's so it's expensive. Free weights are so cheap. And yeah, sure, you buy it and you never have to buy it again because the stuff will literally survive an atomic blast. But boy, I, the amount of money I've dropped on free weights is absolutely absurd uh, because there's always more stuff to buy, more plates, more accessories, more attachments, more different racks and stuff. It's crazy how much money you can spend on free weight stuff. But sandbags and kettlebells have kind of an automatic stopping point to them because you got your kettlebell and that's pretty much about it. And most people only need two or three kettlebells. And you can do most any sort of weighted type exercise with a couple of kettlebells. I know these days it's kind of fashionable to have like a selection of kettlebells where you got racks of the darn things and you're lined up against the wall, the, 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 the baseboard of your bedroom and stuff. But back in the day for guys like me, it was like, you have two kettlebells. You got like a 24 kilogram and like a 16 kilogram, which is 35 and 53 pounds like, there you go. There's your weights. Done. And yeah, that's going to cost a little bit more up front. That's going to be a bit more of investment. But dude, when you buy a kettlebell, you'll have your, you'll be willing it to your grandchildren. That stuff lasts forever. But it doesn't have that same add-on type of mentality of you need this accessory and these attachments and these things and that and that and that and that. And before you know it, that, you know, kettlebell that you spent a hundred dollars on now cost you $600. It's kind of like the old adage of, uh, you know, guys showing off his uh, new apartment or his living room to friends. And they're like, that's a nice couch. He's like, yep, that couch cost me $20,000. <laughs> they're like, what? How does a couch cost you $20,000? Well, we got the couch, which is only $1,200. But then, you know, we realized the couch doesn't go with the love seat. So we had to get the new love seat. Then we realized the couch and the love seat didn't really go very well with the rest of the decor. So we got new carpet. We got new drapes. We had to repaint the walls. Then after we were painting the walls, we realized the TV doesn't work really well there. We want to hang it up, but that type of TV doesn't. So, and it just on and on and on, you know where I'm going with this. Same thing happens with home gym equipment. So if it were me and I was like, all right, limited budget, I want to build a home gym. I would go with a type of suspension setup, either NOSC or the Duonomic ring setup that I highly recommend. And some simple weighted implement, like a couple of kettlebells and or like a sandbag. And I think, don't hold me to this, but I believe I still have my DIY sandbag videos on the Red Delta project as well. I mean, they're old. If you, if you find them, the video quality is terrible. There's almost like no editing to it and stuff. But the sandbag technique that I use to DIY a sandbag is by far the best DIY sandbag uh, implements out there. It doesn't make any mess. It has the perfect amount of play while being structurally sound. It's perfect. Uh, so DIY one of those or just buy one that you can find these days. You can find that stuff anywhere. I had to make them back in the day because, hell, if you went into a fitness store and you asked for a kettlebell, they didn't know what you were talking about. It's like, I want kettlebells and gymnastics rings. And they'd be like, 
why? What, what the heck? A, a kettle ball? What are you talking about? So a lot of the stuff I had to make for myself and I made lots of different sandbags, lots of different DIYs. Most of them weren't very good, but eventually I kind of got a system down and uh, it's probably going to cost about uh, 40 bucks, maybe 50 bucks to build a sandbag. And I'm sure these days you could probably find a DIY one. Uh, shout out also to my man, wild man, uh, Dan over at monkey.co. He's got a new product coming out, Neon Buffalo. You may still be able to check out the Kickstarter for that, which is kind of a sandbag loaded implement. Really, really cool uh, device. Highly recommend you check that out. But anyway, I am rambling on. Let us get to some more questions that I can answer. S. Lee coming on. Hey, Matt, would you advise straight bar dips over parallel dips? Mm. Very good question. Typically not. Um, the straight bar dip requires, in my experience, quite a bit more shoulder stability and mobility for people to implement without like seriously hunching up like crazy. And uh, a lot of times I just find people don't have that. It's not like it's going to be dangerous, but it, they're just not going to get as much out of it. The range isn't going to be as good. The elbows are flaring out like crazy. Uh, it's just not quite the, the move it needs to be. Some people can manage it. So by all means, try both. And in general, if you have access to both dip bars and a straight bar, do both and see which one resonates with you. But in my experience, most people are better off with just simple two handles or doing dips on a suspension and uh, uh, you know rings or something like that is generally a more bang for the buck kind of dip. But uh, see what resonates for you. Jose is asking, any helpful exercises to rehab an injured subscapularis muscle? Talk to your professional. Okay, so here's here's one of those things that seems to be more expensive, but it's going to save you a ton of money in the long run, is when you have issues that you can't get over for yourself, see uh, particular advice in person with a healthcare professional, a chiropractor, a physical therapist, athletic trainer. If you have access to one, like if you're an athlete and they've got one on staff or something, use the hell out of those people. And here's why. Yes, I know you could be like, but my physical therapist, it's like $180 an hour. Good. Definitely spend it because nothing is more expensive than trying to figure something out on your own. And it's not working right away. My usual litmus test is if I could figure it out on my own, I should be able to figure it out within a week. You know, Google searches and stuff like that. The problem though, with injuries and stuff like that is it's anyone's guess. Believe me, whatever advice I gave you, I might as well just shake a magic eight ball for the answer because my I have no freaking idea, no clue whatsoever because I have no idea what the injury is, how you injured it, the um, reason behind it. Are there other supportive muscles behind it? The severity of the injury. I mean, there's a ton of different things. So uh, since you know exactly what it is, you were talking about subscapularis, someone diagnosed that. Go back to them and ask what they might say or email them or something. Because nothing's going to save you far more time and money than getting an expert opinion hands on. The internet has given us this idea that we can get everything we need from Google. Not even close. The internet is a horrible place to get solutions. Terrible. Because most of the time it's a random guess. It's a good place for information. Yes. It's a really good place for ideas. Absolutely. If I want to know what year did uh, Return of the Jedi be released in Japan, the internet's great for that. But when it's time for the bigger, more kind of subjective things, like how do I talk to my crush? How do I lose weight? How do I fix this injury? Internet's a horrible place for that stuff because you're just going to be hunting and pecking for anything. Nothing you find is going to really know, is that going to work? Is that not going to work kind of thing? Most of it is definitely better off for one-on-one -on -one, uh, advice and information. Yes, I know that's going to be more cost up front, but believe me, it's going to save you so much time and effort in the long run and uh, highly recommend that. So that's why I never diagnose pain on the internet. <laughs> Pretty much a, a crapshoot at best. But it, I mean, I went to uh, uh, several healthcare providers over the past year and I spent a lot of money on them. I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars, not because I didn't have any insurance, out of pocket, best money I spent because it saved me so much more in the long run as far as other little like massage guns and oils and all these other sorts of things I was doing to try to address that as well. All right. 
Oh, here's here's a fun one. Average guy fitness. Why some MMA guys so out of shape? Some even have moves. Well, it they're in shape. They're they're in good shape. They're fighters, you know. So this is one of the things I love about the uh, the MMA. Like you're watching the fights, and I sometimes do this as my little joke, where uh, you know guys will come out and they'll be in the like the featherweight division or the bantamweight division or something, and they're like somewhat small, skinnier guys, and they're coming out to the rings and someone I'm just waiting because I usually watch with a bunch of people like at a party or something. So I'm waiting for someone to be like, ah, these guys are kind of small. I'm like, yeah, someone should tell them they need to work out. And it's like, of course, these guys are in the UFC. They work out for a living. Like, of course. And then of course you get to the heavyweight guys and it's like, you know, a little jiggle in the middle kind of thing. And uh, like you said, the moves and it's like, oh, these guys are pretty soft. And like, yeah, again, someone should tell them they need to work out. Of course they're working out. And I love this sort of thing because it brings up again, anecdotally, the fact that fitness is not a good way to change how the body looks. We've been told this since we were into fitness of you exercise this way, your body's going to look that way. And anecdotally, if you look at it, it's a horrible track record. Exercise is first and foremost, always about a functional ability. And it works 100% of the time. If you take on any type of physical activity, anything from stuffing envelopes to powerlifting, your body and your nervous system will adapt to become able to do that thing better. 100% of the time, it always works every time. It never doesn't work because that's what exercise really is about. Is it really about shrinking, building, toning, sculpting? No, that's all marketing. That's all stuff we've been taught that fitness is about. It's not. Yeah, it does happen, it can happen, but there's so many other variables and factors like we were talking about genetics earlier, that are also influenced to that, that it's not a direct thing. Like some people, yeah, if I do push-ups, will I build a bigger chest? I don't know, maybe. Maybe there's no way to know. Will you get better at push-ups? 100%, absolutely. So these MMA guys, they're, they don't care about moves. They care about not being able to <laughs> die in the ring. They're, they're trained to kick ass, not look good uh, for a magazine cover. And that's why they're in shape is because they can kick my ass any day of the week, I'm sure. And so that's how uh, fitness actually works. It's not about how they look. Leroy, the man, one more before we jump back into the topic. Hey, Matt, I progressed fairly great. My work out the last two months. Congrats. But really see joint uh, ache, fatigue, CNS burnout is occurring. Would a planned out deload every four or eight weeks be beneficial? Uh, never tried it. Yeah, sure. Uh, go for it. Give yourself a bit of a break, uh, especially if you're burning out in about two months or so, or try something different, you know, the active rest kind of thing. So switch up your programming a little bit. But yeah, if you're getting burned out, by all means, uh, scale it back a little bit and cut the volume uh, a bit. That can be very helpful. But uh, yeah, cut back, cut back. Let your body rest, man. Uh, it's no one ever got in shape by beating themselves to a pulp continuously 365. Uh, again, look at the MMA fighters. So you look at their training, you look at what they're doing and the magazines are reporting what they're doing. They're not doing that year round. <laughs> you know, athletes have their periodized program according to their seasons. You look at what they do on some parts of their training around competition. You're like, doesn't this guy ever work out? It's like, yeah, he's in this part of the cycle. <laughs> you know, he's letting his body recover. It's not a 24 seven sort of deal. All right, let's talk diet. Let's talk diet. How do we save money and uh, uh, stretch the dollars? Well, it's kind of a myth, excuse me, that a healthy diet is more expensive. You hear this all the time. It's like, look at this value meal from this burger chain. It's like 98 cents. Oh, and if you look at this salad that you can get, it's like $47. Or I'm being, I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea, right? And I'm looking at that going like, holy hell, how the hell is a salad $9 at this place? I can make a salad for under three bucks. And it's a good salad too. I'm not talking iceberg lettuce and like a little sliver of turkey on it. I'm talking about a salad that makes you drop to your knees and thank God you've got taste buds kind of salad. The type of salad that you would gladly turn down a cheeseburger for. Because my dad is the master of salad making. And he taught me how to make salads. And I can make a mean salad. I had one for lunch today, as a matter of fact. And it is very good and very satisfying. So this whole idea of like, oh, you've got to spend so much money to get good food and stuff. 
No, not at all. In fact, I personally have been really cutting back on my grocery budget and my diet has gotten so much healthier because of that. I'm saving money and eating healthier. And it largely boils down to one, I'm not buying nearly as much of the snacky foods and stuff. I'm back to more of a, a mindset of if I'm eating, I'm eating a meal. Like it's not little like protein bars and little snacks and little num nums and little things like this. It's like, no, I'm eating a sandwich with an apple and, you know, something good to drink, like my black tea. You know, if I go to and have my dinner, it's dinner. It's a full on meal. So you cut back on all of that like little snacky stuff. And that goes a long way because it's, it's funny too. Uh, I've noticed prices in the grocery store. A lot of the snacky stuff is the stuff that's getting more expensive. Like I used to get these um, like uh, snack sandwich cookie kind of things. And the prices on these things is just exploding like crazy. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. But to a large degree, I've noticed produce is not too different out here. It's up a little bit, but it's not nearly as different. So you can get a bag of apples still at my local grocery store for like three or four bucks, a bag of apples. But a Snickers bar is damn near $3 now. So people are like, oh, it's so much unhealthier. It's so much harder to eat healthy. You have a snack, a Snickers bar, $3. An apple from that bag will be like 45 cents. So it's definitely a lot easier to eat healthy than a lot of this stuff you find on the internet will tell you about. And again, it comes down to regular, simple, basic, whole foods. Produce section, fruits, vegetables. Get regular whole foods. Rice, regular bread, like not like super um, different types of like fancy breads, like just good old fashioned bread that you can cut by the slice. You can get like $1.99 for an entire loaf of that stuff. Uh, you have regular pro, uh, protein sources, eggs, chicken. Uh, over at Costco, you can get regular whole cooked white breast meat that they just take off the bone of rotisserie chicken. And it's like five pounds of this stuff for like 14 bucks. And man, you get one of those, you can add chicken to everything you eat for over a week. It's $14 for that. Tuna fish is one of my classic staples. A couple of cans of that, six bucks. I've got like five or six sandwiches out of that. So it's not this idea of like, oh, healthy eating is so expensive. Healthy eating prices for food goes along just like processed stuff. The more packaged stuff is, the more expensive it's going to be. Again, it comes down to price uh, of time versus money. A single bell pepper I can get for under a dollar. But if you go in some places in the produce section, you can get like bell peppers and onions that are sliced up and you get them pre-packed and stuff. And that's like six bucks. So it's like, well, are you willing to spend the time to cut up a couple bell peppers? Or are you like, I don't even want to bother with it. Then you buy the packaged bell pepper slices for six bucks. You're spending money, but you're saving time. Or you could just get a couple bell peppers for $2, not even that. I think it's like $1.50 at my place. And you just cut them up yourself and there you go. So the whole regular foods, the less processed, the better. We've been told this since we were blue in the face for the sake of health. But it's also actually some of the most cost efficient ways to stay on your diet as well. Let's get to some more questions here. Gato with the awesome avatar coming on. Hey, Matt, question, a bit of complex question. But I notice if I have breakfast, I often get pretty lethargic during workouts, around two, three hours between. Should I just intermittent fast? I did before. Mm. That's interesting. Well, it uh, depends on timing, of course, and it depends on what the content is. Now, a lot of times I've seen recommendations if you have breakfast, make sure it's relatively protein heavy. Uh, not the breakfast cereal with skim milk kind of option. I mean, I don't think anybody's doing that anymore. Seriously, does anybody eat cereal these days? But um, if you're getting a lot of your carbohydrate heavy stuff and then you're working out several hours later, you might just be sending it right on through and your energy level is low with that. So try to make your uh, breakfast more protein heavy. I'm a big fan of eggs myself, you know, or uh, have uh, like breakfast sandwiches that I, ma I make uh, breakfast sandwiches myself. I have a little breakfast sandwich panini maker kind of thing. It's pretty cool. And uh, boy, that stuff will stick with you for a while. Also look at the caffeine you're consuming. 
in the morning too. I notice if I drink way too much caffeine early in the day, I get a crash in the afternoon. So look at the caffeine there as well. If you're drinking like two or three cups of coffee, maybe cut it back to one. Uh, and uh, the other thing could be that it's just the time of day when you have your natural dip. A lot of times people think their energy level is supposed to be relatively high all day, but we're supposed to have ebbs and flows with our energy level and our natural circadian rhythm throughout the day. So your workout may just be falling into that time when you're getting a little bit of that lull in the energy level. So maybe that would be an opportunity to get a little caffeine boost before that. Speaking of which, let's talk about uh, one of the other dietary areas that we can save a lot of money on is the supplement game. Uh, I've known people who spend literally hundreds of dollars every month on various pills and potions and bars. And when, it, when I talk about supplements, I'm not just talking about GNC stuff. I'm talking about anything that people buy because it's like the diet stuff. Like these are Atkins friendly granola bars, or these are keto ice cream bars, and diet foods, basically, right? We got supplements, we got diet foods. Most of it's a complete waste of your money. Not because it's bad, it's actually very good. It could be perfectly fine, but it's basically like, you know, buying bottled water. You're spending a lot of money for the same stuff you just get from your tap, depending on where you live, of course. You know, my parents live in Florida, their tap water is definitely not like bottled water. But a lot of times when we're buying this specialty stuff that we think is special because it's in a particular package or it's got a label or a brand behind it, it's just the same old fluff that is in eggs. You know, technically supplements aren't anything that's not found in food. That's why they call it a supplement. So for my money, the best pre-workout in the world, I know I get questions here all the time about what are, what's your favorite pre-workout and stuff. Simple, black tea every single time. Love my fast lane tea. It comes from Celestial Seasons out here. It's just a simple black tea. Best pre-workout out there. And it's way cheaper than any of that, you know, Chernobyl glow-in-the-dark powder stuff that you put in orange juice beforehand kind of thing. So a lot of times the diet stuff and the, the supplement stuff and the package stuff and stuff, it, again, I don't think it's necessarily always bad. It's just really, really overpriced applesauce nine times out of ten applesauce in quotes, metaphorically speaking. So generally, whenever you're uh, looking on uh, supplements or special uh, types of foods and things, you can get the same thing way cheaper with regular whole foods. Like, do you take amino acid supplements? Yeah, they're called eggs. <laughs> I can get uh, 18 of them at Costco for five bucks. You know, that's my amino acid supplement. And uh, that's a uh, generally a good way to save money. But in my, my my opinion too, you just get so much more from food. You know, if I had an amino acid supplement, I'm getting like what, three grams of protein in this little powdery pill thing that's, you know, 60 bucks a jar or whatever, depending on the brand and stuff. I'm like, dude, you're going to get so much more from the egg. You're going to get taste and texture. You're going to get satiety from it. You're going to have more enjoyment from it. You just, food is the way to go. It just brings a lot more for less cost as well. All right, more here. Oh, I just answered that one. Thank you very much. Again, folks, if you put a hey mat in the content section, it's one of those things that I can get you uh, to uh, address. Photon, hey mat. I just want to ask if you've heard of the athletic the CBD stick, and if so, what do you think of it? I don't know anything about it, though. I have also asked what specific exercise would you recommend for six-pack abs? I know about diet side, of course, yes. Anything that just works the abs. Remember, the abs are connected down to pubic bone and up to the coastal ridge of your abs. Anything that causes them to get closer, like a flexion chain exercise, or resists extension, like when you're doing planks or stretch outs and stuff, whatever you like with that will work. You know, muscle is actually a very simple concept. It has an origin and insertion point, and anything that causes you to bring those two together under tension or under resistance, rather, or try to bring the two together under resistance, like with an isometric, will work. It's not about the exercise. Always remember, exercises do not work muscles. They don't. You know, you hear push-ups, they work the chest. No, the push-up does not work your chest. You turn on the chest to do the push-up. <laughs> The, it's, it's not a cart before the horse kind of deal. Your brain is what engages the muscle. Always remember that when it comes to your training, your brain is the engine for your muscle. So anytime we're like, I want my muscles to be able to do the thing, 
make sure your brain can do that. And that's why I'm a big fan of overcoming isometrics because a lot of us have really poor neuromuscular activation. And I've always said it, if you have trouble engaging a muscle very well, abs are a very common occurrence, nothing you do will ever work. Nothing, no exercise, no program, no gadget, nothing will be effective for it. But if you can get that engagement to a higher level, again, I recommend the overcoming isometrics, by far the easiest and fastest way to make that happen, then anything you do will work. Literally everything, pick any ab exercise at random, pick any program, just close your eyes and throw a dart. If you've got activation, it'll work. And then it's just a matter of tweaking things like how long is it and how's the intensity and things like that. So that gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility. So whenever we're like, I need to work this muscle, get the activation high and then basic exercises that will engage that as well. Let's see, <clears throat> uh, Ben is asking, what do you think of bridges as a workout or as exercise in general? I love bridges. I think they're fantastic. Again, though, I don't think a lot of people have good posterior activation to make them really work very well. Uh, a lot of times people do bridges and I'm like, great, how's that in your hamstrings? And they'd be like, what hamstrings? I'm like, ah, that's a problem, yes. <laughs> so you wanna make sure that you're able to engage. A lot of times when people do bridges, they're like, it's all in the lower back. Oh, it's all in the lower back. That's a big problem. That's like when doing squats and you're like, it's all in the knees, it's all in the knees. The lower back's more like a joint than anything else. You wanna feel a good amount of activation from the back of your shoulders, hell, even your triceps if you've got your arms behind you, all the way to your calves. So it's a con, uh, complete arc of tension as evenly distributed as possible if, if uh, you can. But boy, if you can get that, bridges are one of the best therapeutic, anti-sitting, mobility, easier to breathe exercises that we can possibly do. I know uh, con um, Paul Wade, you know, uh, talked in convict conditioning, very, spoke very highly of bridges. And it took me uh, about uh, three years until I finally started to adopt any sort of bridging in my workouts. And I deeply regret that uh, when he was like, sell all your weights and just do bridges. They're better for your performance. I think he was onto something. I'm, I'm not going to tell people to sell their weights. But I think it's definitely one of those things that brings a lot more to the proverbial table than people realize. Photon asking again, hey Matt, now you bring it up, I'm wondering if you watch the UFC and what do you think uh, wins Alex? Uh, who do you think wins between Alex and Israel, maybe John Jones? I haven't actually been following very much lately, um, largely because a friend of mine uh, who I always watch the UFC with, he's been out of town and so I haven't been, I haven't, I don't think I've seen a fight for like six months. So I'm way out of the loop these days. I, I'm like, I, I have no idea uh, kind of stuff. Uh, so another point to save money though, let's get back on track. So one of the biggest costly things are guys like me, <laughs> coaches and people who can get you to work out better. On one hand, you've got personal trainers and coaches and stuff, and we can be the best money you spend because if they know what you're doing, then they can really fast track you very quickly. I always tell people like my job as a trainer is to improve every workout you ever do every time we meet. Like if I say, okay, move your shoulders this way, do pushups that way and stuff, good. I just improved every workout you do for the rest of your life here in this five minute session. That's always my job. It's not to just get you to work better in this workout, but every workout you ever do. So in that regard, it's like, you know, you, you spend X amount of money for an hour of personal training, but if it benefits you in some small way for the rest of your life, what's, you know, $180 or 120 or whatever they're charging over the course of every workout you do. It's pretty good money well spent. They can also be very efficient. And uh, I mean, I swear half of my job is telling people don't worry about half the stuff they think they need to do and spend money on um, in order to get in shape. So they can end up saving you a lot as well. But sometimes you just can't have the scratch for a coach or trainer, or you just don't have access to one too. And that can be a bit of a bugaboo. And I know we've got the internet and stuff. I've, I offer remote coaching as well, but it's not nearly the same as in-person training. But what about self-coaching? What about coaching for yourself? What can you do with that? Simple. So I would say probably a good part of my job is literally writing down what people have done 
and then looking at what they've done and saying, oh, you did 10 reps last time. Okay, do 12 reps this time. Like a lot of my, my expertise as a trainer just comes from that clipboard. Or now, of course, I have a Google Doc that I follow. Uh, that's it. <laughs> it's just keeping them on track and telling them how to do things 1% better. Because that's literally about what makes training effective is staying on track and progressing over time. If you can do those two things, you're going to get what you want out of your workouts. So keep a simple workout log. That's one of, by far, the best ways to save a ton of time and a ton of energy. And yes, even a ton of money because that log effectively becomes like a coach. You write down what you've done. It tells you what you've done. It tells you ideas on what you can do moving forward. And yes, I recommend my own personal workout log system called the scoreboard progression log, which is even more efficient. You barely ever need to write anything down. It's much more direct and tells you what you need to do. And again, yes, it's absolutely free. It's one of the free eBooks that I have at reddeltaproject.com. Completely free download. You only need one sheet of paper if you're using it the classic analog style or simply one screen of a Google Doc format. And all you do is you write down your personal best and you only change things when you improve things. Now, I know a lot of times uh, the criticism people have with that system is, so like if you do two sets of pull-ups, for example, you got 10 and then you got eight. And on the next workout, you got 10 and you got seven. You don't write anything down. You're only interested in changing things if you make progress. So people will sometimes say, well, how do you know if you're making progress? Well, one, uh, if you're asking, you probably aren't. Two is if uh, you are making progress, it should be very self-evident. Sorry, it's getting a little dark here. Let me improve the ISO on the camera here. We got some clouds rolling in here. Let's see, bring that up a little bit. There we go. So anyway, that scoreboard will save you a lot. It's really easy to use and very, very time efficient. Uh, so scoreboard there. The second thing to do is use a timer app like on your phone. I use the Gym Boss timer. I've used it for years. And one of the other jobs that I have as a coach and a trainer is just telling people to go. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm tired. I'm, I'm kind of, I need a breather. I'm like, lunges, go. And they're like, okay. And I got to push them a little bit. Like, nope, not rest. Not just yet. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Timers do very much a similar thing like a, a Tabata timer, for example. I've been doing the Tabata timer, as I mentioned in the last episode on my isometrics. So coming that fourth through fifth round, I'm doing my hold and it says, beep, okay, good, I get to rest. And then I see that timer clicking down, I'm like, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go. My arms are beep, oh, son of a bitch. And it, and it forces you to stay on track with your workouts. It forces you to be like, okay, go. Even if you're just timing your rest periods, like three minutes, like, okay, it keeps you on pace. So scoreboard progression log, workout timer app, just to kind of keep you on pace for your workouts. That alone, oh, and the third resource I recommend is probably the one you already have, the camera on your phone. The best app for fitness is the camera on your phone. Why? Because it helps you assess your technique. We all have a different image in our head of what we're doing versus what we really are doing. I mean, I've got the luxury of making YouTube videos, so I'll make a video I'm like, okay, here I am doing lunges. And then I'll look at the playback and it's like, oh, oh dear Lord, that's what my lunges look like? Oh God, Ugh. oh man, I got work to do. Film yourself doing your exercises, self-assessment. And you'll have those three things. You'll have the scoreboard, uh, workout log, you'll have the timer, and you'll have self-assessment self with your video. You put those three things together, you're gonna get a lot of the value that a coach and a personal trainer brings to the table and all three of those are largely free and available on your phone. So there you go, self-coaching, saving you money all over the place. Let's see what else we can do here. I know I'm not answering a lot of questions here, just a lot to cover. Tim Dunes, hey Matt, thoughts on long rest periods for endurance, conditioning, training, like Quick and the Dead from Pavel. So always remember that we've got the, tr the tension triangle. You know, I just adjusted my ISO on my camera here because in photography, you have the exposure triangle. You've got your three variables that influence the uh, amount of um, exposure. You got your shutter speed, you got your aperture, and you've got your ISO. Well, in exercise, we've got the tension triangle, which is how much tension is in the muscle, how many repetitions you do, and rest period. 
So the, the time that you're resting for yourself. And those three variables are effectively the three things you program for anything when it comes to your workout programming. So when it comes to your rest periods, think about it this way. The more time you can rest, the more energy and effort you can put into your next set. So do you benefit more from that? Less rest periods, the less energy you're going to have, and it's more it's going to push your endurance and stamina. So do you benefit from that? And just like the exposure triangle in photography, it's kind of like, well, should I increase my shutter speed or not? It's like, well, it depends on your circumstances, depends on what you're trying to do with the camera. Same thing with your programming. Should I have longer rest periods or shorter rest periods? Well, do you want to have the ability to really crush the next set with as much as possible? Or do you want to not have as much to crush the next set? And that's what you adjust your rest periods for. I'm usually telling people rest as needed because there are so many other variables that influence how much time you can rest. There's the exercise you do. There's how much you push towards failure. There's speed. There's the amount of tension you hold. There's your skill and proficiency. There's your conditioning. There's just even your general condition for the day. You know, if you were up late partying last night, you're going to need more rest in between sets if you want to bring a lot more to each set. So that's why I usually tell people rest as needed. But generally, shorter rest periods, more endurance, longer rest periods, you can improve things like strength and proficiency and skills and things like that because you're not as tired. It's basically about managing fatigue. Sometimes fatigue helps. Sometimes fatigue hurts. It all kind of depends on what you're going on after. Oh, here's a good one. Poppy's saying, I've been getting rug burns on my tailbone the last few times doing leg raises. I have no idea why any clue. Yes, of course. So a couple of things are going on. But when we do line leg raises, you have to think of it as working two joints. You've got your hip joint. Okay, so you got your hip joint where your legs lift. And then, of course, you've got your lumbar uh, flexion. And you also have a little bit of extension. So what's going on? is as you're doing your leg raises, one of those things, probably your lumbar flexion, isn't quite getting dialed in. And as a result, your legs are pulling and moving your body forward and back, and your tailbone is kind of rubbing against the floor. So I recommend a couple of things. One is just slow the F down. <laughs> Go much, much slower. Make sure that you are pulling your hips up, because basically your abs don't move your legs. Your abs pull up your pubic bone. They basically pick up your tailbone, if you will. So get, start with your legs straight up and your tailbone off the ground. Come down like you're rolling your lower back and your butt onto the floor. And once you feel like your lower back's about to pick up, doesn't matter where your legs are, then you pick back up. Because the goal with leg raises is just keep that posterior pelvic tilt, your lower back pressed to the floor, and you can keep your legs coming down through only the action in your hips. But a lot of people have a real hard time doing that. Again, poor abdominal muscle activation. So they're arching their back. So you're basically just grinding your tailbone into the floor. So come down only to the point with your legs that you feel you can keep your lower back on the floor and then come back up. So you're basically rolling your tailbone up, but don't let it come down and your lower back up. That may help. Uh, another thing too is maybe do it on hardwood floors. So it's not as much friction. Uh, between your tailbone and the floor as well. That's uh, Oh, here's one is interesting. Aiden asking, why are dips so much harder than push-ups? I don't feel like I can do one with proper form. A couple of reasons. The biggest one, you're just using a hell of a lot more weight, my friend. When you do push-ups, you don't have your full weight on your hands. You've got it distributed between your hands and your feet. That's why incline push-ups are easier at first because most of your weight is on your feet and you only have a certain percentage on your hands. And as your hands go lower towards the floor, using less incline, or even you bring your legs up a little bit like on a weight bench, you're putting more weight onto your hands. Remember, progressive calisthenics is still weightlifting. And you add resistance the exact same way as weightlifting. You add weight to the arms or legs working. So when you're doing regular dips, you've got all your weight on your hands. So that's the biggest reason. Second is you're using several of your muscles towards a more elongated position towards the end of the range of motion. So we typically have more tension and strength in a muscle when it's fully flexed, and we lose the ability to, to generate force when the muscle elongates. When you do a dip, the anterior deltoid and your pectorals typically get a lot more stretch as you uh, extend your shoulder backwards more. So 
those are probably a, a couple of other reasons, but the biggest mechanical reasons why dips are so much harder. And that's why I'll, I'll typically use um, dips as like a, a bit of a push-up progression. Sometimes if I, I'm giving people a lot of push-ups in the bodyweight gym and they're like, I'm so sick of push-ups and stuff. I'm like, okay, let's start to move on to dips a little bit because dips and push-ups are fundamentally about the same thing. Uh, they're just getting the, the weight and the technique a little bit different there as well. All right. Last couple of questions before we finish on off. Tim Toons. Hey, Matt. Thoughts on long rest. Oh, sorry. I got that one already. Excusez-moi. Ben is asking, hey, Matt, what do you think of bridges? I got that as well. Can you hear the thunder outside? That's why it's getting darker. Jeez, I got to increase my ISO again. It's crazy. Once those storm clouds start coming in here, it gets really dark. It's kind of ominous. Maybe... We have tornado warnings out here for a reason. <laughs> uh, ben is acting. Hey, Matt, is front uh, lever yielding or overcoming isometric? It's uh, yielding. Uh, so remember, uh, yielding isometric is one where if you do not have enough tension in the muscle, you lose technique. You fall. Uh, you drop the weight. Uh, you have to stop, in other words. Uh, an overcoming isometric, there is no minimum amount or maximum amount of tension you need to generate in order to do the exercise. You can just hold it potentially indefinitely. Let's see. Ben is uh, there. Very good. Boy, I really need to catch up on some of these questions. Sorry, folks. I don't mean to ignore anything, but uh, it's uh, sometimes I get lost in my own mind. Mariano, hey, Matt. What happened to the idea of making a video every month where you showed us the routine of that month uh, executed by you? And how is the overcoming routine going that you told us? Very good. Overcoming isometrics is absolutely phenomenal, my friend. Uh, it is making such big changes in my ability to move and exercise. I, I can't even tell you how great it is. Uh, so yeah, the idea of making a video every, so basically I was demonstrating the grind style calisthenics videos uh, and uh, basically doing the workouts so you guys could see what they were like. A couple of things happened. One is I had a major ski accident in April that basically left me unable to do almost anything with my left leg. Uh, so that put a real damper on that. Second is the guy who, uh, my good friend, who I incidentally also go and see the UFC fights with, uh, it's actually his place that I crash at, uh, he was just out of town and totally unavailable for a couple of months, and I couldn't find anybody to just hold the camera as I'm going through the workouts. Uh, and also, when I look back on it, the workouts that I did for that that I had already uh, were kind of the general grind style calisthenics approach and the splits i had you know push and flexion pull and extension squat and lateral but i also had pps and elf uh, the support and movement chain workouts and i was like that's kind of a good base level of approach for my workouts for right now um so basically i was like i i just can't keep this thing going right now i'm just getting to the point now where my legs are back in shape so maybe i'll start making some more of those I'm also looking into making some uh, suspension follow at home workouts as well. So that's another free resource I'm coming out with uh, for you folks is home workout videos because suspension training is very good for that. You just hang up your straps and uh, the idea is you're going to just follow along with me and I'll take you through a workout. So look for those coming out soon uh, for those as well. A couple last ones, Tim Toons. Hey, Matt, could you explain stimulate, don't annihilate a little more, especially for hypertrophy uh, when burning uh, the muscle is a thing. So basically think about it this way. Are you working out to teach the muscle something or are you just trying to exhaust it? So whenever I think of like annihilate, the whole annihilate approach, it's like, I'm just trying to drive myself into the ground. Okay. I don't care about how well I can do anything. I'm just going to make myself tired. Really easy to do. Easiest workout format out there. Very cathartic to do that. But stimulate means, okay, this is what I can do. I was able to do my exercise this way, this many sets, reps, weight, range of motion, whatever. And then you go in your workout log and I'm like, that's right. I'm trying to get my chest to the bar with my pull-ups. And I'm also uh, at a set of 10 and then a set of eight. So today's workout, I'm trying to get a set of 10 and then maybe nine or 10, but I'm also going to try and get my chest more to the bar. So I'm going to try and do that. That's stimulate. Stimulate means you're teaching your muscles. You're trying to do it better. Annihilate just drives yourself into the ground, which can be very fun, 
But remember, our body adapts according to a stimulus, not just fatigue and exhaustion. So, all right. Oh, let me address this one because I get this one a lot. Matt, uh, people say cis squat is bad for the knees, but ironically, the same exercise fix an APN from years of heavy lifting. Same exact experience here. It, it is one of those things that, yeah, it can be bad for the knees if you don't know what you're doing. And I was one of those people who for years was like, yeah, sissy squat is terrible for the knees. But I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> a big part of it is keeping your hips tight, glutes especially. And not only does keeping your glutes tight help pull stress out of your knees, but it also makes your quads work a hell of a lot better as well. So keep those glutes and hamstrings on, folks, when you do your sissy squats and be prudent about it. You don't need to force it as well because another compounding variable with that is can you keep your quads engaged in an elongated position? As I was explaining before, it's a lot harder to generate enough tension in a muscle when it is elongated and nothing will elongate your quads more than the sissy squat. So when you are doing sissy squats, a lot of people turn off their quads or significantly reduce the amount of tension in the quads because they're not that strong at it. And as a result, the tension in the quads, boom, goes right into the knees as well. So don't go as deep. Maybe try the Hindu squats or something or really get good at just simple deep squats as well. And you can also try the sissy squat isometric. That's a real easy one. You just kneel on the floor. You wrap like a yoga strap or an iso loop around your legs. So that's around uh, the top of your ankles to the your thigh near your hip. And just try to stand up. That's a fun one as well. That'll get the quads burning really, really good. It's an isometric sissy squat, but it helps you learn how to generate tension in that elongated position. All right, folks, we got a major storm coming on in here. I'm going to take off, make sure the windows of my car are closed, but uh, thank you very much for coming on in. Best of luck to everyone out there if you are kind of struggling a little bit when it comes to the financials these days. I know stuff isn't as easy as it was several months ago, but I promise it won't last forever. I mean, hell, a meteorite's going to come and destroy us all at some point, right? Now, I always look on the bright side of things, but always remember that when it comes to getting in shape, there's always very viable options out there for you that are not going to break the bank. And I usually find, for me personally, when things are getting a little bit tougher in my life, that exercise and the ability to just go for a bike ride or bang out some pull-ups and stuff is still an anchoring point that gives me a bit of a catharsis and stress relief and lets me know that at least, if nothing else, I can still be strong and healthy and fit despite all the other chaos in my life. So thank you very much for watching and listening. I sincerely appreciate it. Again, check out resources down below and at reddeltaproject.com. I'll talk to you folks next week. Till then, be fit and live free.